Part 3. In Defended Peace 1. Soviet Strongman Small villages were numerous in the northwest, but towns of any size were infrequent. Except for the industries begun by the Reds, it was agrarian and in places semi-pastoral country. Thus, it was quite breathtaking to ride out suddenly on the brow of the wrinkled hills and see stretched out below me in a green valley the ancient walls of Baoan, which means defended peace. Baoan was once a frontier stronghold during the Jin and Tang dynasties against the nomadic invaders to the north. Remains of its fortifications, flame-struck in that afternoon's sun, could be seen flanking the narrow pass through which once emptied into this valley the conquering legions of the Mongols. There was an inner city still, where the garrisons were once quartered, and a high defensive masonry, lately improved by the Reds, embraced about a square mile in which the present town was located. Here at last I found the Red leader whom Nanjing had been fighting for ten years, Mao Zedong, chairman of the Chinese People's Soviet Republic to employ the official title which had recently been adopted. The old cognomen, Chinese Workers and Peasants Soviet Republic, was dropped when the Reds began their new policy of struggle for a united front. Zhou Enlai's radiogram had been received, and I was expected. A room was provided for me in the foreign office, and I had become temporarily a guest of the Soviet state. My arrival resulted in a phenomenal increase of the foreign population of Baoan. The other occidental resident was a German known as Li De Tongzhi, the victorious comrade Li of Li De, the only foreign advisor ever with the Chinese Red Army, more later. I met Mao soon after my arrival, a gaunt, rather Lincoln-esque figure, above average height for a Chinese, somewhat stooped with a head of thick black hair grown very long, and with large, searching eyes, a high-bridged nose and prominent cheekbones. My fleeting impression was of an intellectual face of great shrewdness, but I had no opportunity to verify this for several days. Next time I saw him, Mao was walking hatless along the street at dusk, talking with two young peasants and gesticulating earnestly. I did not recognise him until he was pointed out to me, moving along unconcernedly with the rest of the strollers, despite the 250,000 which Nanjing hung over his head. I could have written a book about Mao Zedong. I talked with him many nights, on a wide range of subjects, and I heard dozens of stories about him from soldiers and communists. My written interviews with him totaled about 20,000 words. He told me of his childhood and youth, how he became a leader in the Guomindang and the Nationalist Revolution, why he became a communist, and how the Red Army grew. He described the long march to the northwest and wrote a classical poem about it for me, he told me stories of many other famous Reds, from Judur down to the youth who carried on his shoulders over 6,000 miles the two iron dispatch boxes that held the archives of the Soviet government. The story of Mao's life was a rich cross-section of a whole generation, an important guide to understanding the sources of action in China, and I have included that full, exciting record of personal history, just as he told it to me. But here my own impressions of him may be worth recording. There would never be any one saviour of China, yet undeniably one felt a certain force of destiny in Mao. It was nothing quick or flashy, but a kind of solid elemental vitality. One felt that whatever there was extraordinary in this man grew out of the uncanny degree to which he synthesised and expressed the urgent demands of millions of Chinese, and especially the peasantry. If their demands and the movement which was pressing them forward were the dynamics which could regenerate China, then in that deeply historical sense, Mao Zedong might possibly become a very great man. Meanwhile, Mao was of interest as a personality, apart from his political life, because although his name was as familiar to many Chinese as that of Jiang Kai-shek, very little was known about him, and all sorts of strange legends existed about him. I was the first foreign newspaper man to interview him. Mao had the reputation of a charmed life. He had been repeatedly pronounced dead by his enemies, only to return to the news columns a few days later, as active as ever. The Guomindang had also officially killed and buried Judea many times, assisted by occasional collaborations from clairvoyant missionaries. Numerous deaths of the two famous men, nevertheless, did not prevent them from being involved in many spectacular exploits, including the Long March. Mao was indeed in one of his periods of newspaper demise when I visited Red China, but I found him quite substantially alive. There were good reasons why people said that he had a charmed life, however. Although he had been in scores of battles, was once captured by enemy troops and escaped, and had the world's highest reward on his head, during all these years he had never once been wounded. I happened to be in Mao's house one evening when he was given a complete physical examination by a red surgeon, 
a man who had studied in Europe and knew his business, and pronounced in excellent health. He had never had tuberculosis or any incurable disease as had been rumoured by some romantic travellers. His lungs were completely sound, although, unlike most Red Commanders, he was an inordinate cigarette smoker. During the long march, Mao and Li De had carried original botanical research by testing out various kinds of leaves as tobacco substitutes. He Zhen, Mao's second wife, a former schoolteacher and a communist organiser herself, had been less than fortunate than her husband. She had suffered more than a dozen wounds caused by splinters from an air bomb, but all of them were superficial. Just before I left Baoan, the Maos were proud parents of a new baby girl. He had two other children by his former wife, Yang Kaihui, the daughter of his favourite professor. She was killed in Changsha in 1930 at the order of General He Jian, warlord of Hunan province. Mao Zedong was 43 years old when I met him in 1936. He was elected chairman of the Provisional Central Soviet Government at the Second All-China Soviet Congress, attended by delegates representing approximately 9 million people, then living under red laws. Here, incidentally, it may be inserted that Mao Zedong estimated the maximum population of the various districts under the direct control of the Soviet Central Government in 1933 as follows. Jiangxi Soviet, 3 million. Hubei and Hui, Henan Soviet, 2 million. Hunan, Jiangxi, Hubei Soviet, 1 million. Jiangxi, Hunan Soviet, 1 million. Zhejiang, Fujian Soviet, 1 million. Hunan, Hubei Soviet, 1 million. Total, 9 million. Fantastic estimates ranging as high as 10 times that figure were evidently achieved by adding up the entire population in every area in which the Red Army or Red Partisans had been reported as operating. Mao laughed when I quoted him the figure of 80 million people living under the Chinese Soviets, and said that when they had that big an area, the revolution would be practically won. But of course, there were many millions in all the areas where Red Partisans had operated. The influence of Mao Zedong throughout the communist world of China was probably greater than that of anyone else. He was a member of nearly everything. The Revolutionary Military Committee, the Political Bureau of the Central Committee, the Finance Commission, the Organizational Committee, the Public Health Commission, and others. His real influence was asserted through his domination of the Political Bureau, which had decisive power in the policies of the party, the government, and the army. Yet, while everyone knew and respected him, there was, as yet at least, no ritual of hero worship built up around him. I never met a Chinese Red who drooled our great leader phrases. I did not hear Mao's name used as a synonym for the Chinese people, but still I never met one who did not like the chairman, as everyone called him, and admire him. The role of his personality in the movement was clearly immense. Mao seemed to me a very interesting and complex man. He had the simplicity and naturalness of the Chinese peasant, with a lively sense of humour and a love of rustic laughter. His laughter was even active on the subject of himself and the shortcomings of the Soviets, a boyish sort of laughter which never in the least shook his inner faith in his purpose. He was a plain speaking and plain living, and some people might have considered him rather coarse and vulgar. Yet he combined curious qualities of naivety with incisive wit and worldly sophistication. I think my first impression, dominantly one of native shrewdness, was probably correct. And yet Mao was an accomplished scholar of classical Chinese, an omnivorous reader, a deep student of philosophy and history, a good speaker, a man with an unusual memory and extraordinary powers of concentration, an able writer, careless in his personal habits and appearance, but astonishingly meticulous about details of duty, a man of tireless energy, and a military and political strategist of considerable genius. It was interesting that many Japanese regarded him as the ablest Chinese strategist alive. The Reds were putting up some new buildings in Baoan, but accommodations were very primitive while I was there. Mao lived with his wife in a two-room yaofang, with bare, poor, map-covered walls. He had known much worse as the son of a rich peasant in Hunan, he had also known better. The Mao's chief luxury, like Joe's, was a mosquito net. Otherwise Mao lived very much like the rank and file of the Red Army. After ten years of leadership of the Reds, after hundreds of confiscations of property of landlords, officials and tax collectors, he owned only his blankets and a few personal belongings, including two cotton uniforms. Although he was a Red Army commander as well as chairman, he wore on his coat collar only the two red bars that are the insignia of the ordinary red soldier. I went with Mao several times to mass meetings of the villagers and the red cadets, and to the red theatre. He sat inconspicuously in the midst of the crowd and enjoyed himself hugely. I remember once between acts of the anti-Japanese theatre, there was a general demand for a duet by Mao Zedong and Lin Biao, 
The 28-year-old president of the Hongzhen Daxie, Red Army University, and formerly a famed young cadet on Chiang Kai-shek's staff, Lin blushed like a schoolboy and got them out of the command performance by a graceful speech calling upon the women communists for a song instead. Mao's food was the same as everybody's, but being a Hunanese, he had the southerner's ai la, or love of pepper. He even had pepper cooked into his bread. Except for this passion, he scarcely seemed to notice what he ate. One night at dinner I heard him expand on a theory of pepper-loving peoples being revolutionaries. He first submitted his own province, Hunan, famous for the revolutionaries it has produced. Then he listed Spain, Mexico, Russia, and France to support his contention, but laughingly had to admit defeat when somebody mentioned the well-known Italian love of red pepper and garlic, in refutation of his theory. One of the most amusing songs of the bandits, incidentally, was a ditty called The Hot Red Pepper. It told of the disgust of the pepper with his pointless vegetable existence, waiting to be eaten, and how he ridiculed the contentment of the cabbages, spinaches, and beans with their invertebrate careers. He ends up by leading a vegetable insurrection. The hot red pepper was a favourite of Chairman Mao. He appeared to be quite free from symptoms of megalomania, but he had a deep sense of personal dignity, and something about him suggested a power of ruthless decision when he deemed it necessary. I never saw him angry, but I heard from others that on occasions he had been roused to an intense and withering fury. At such times his command of irony and invective was said to be classic and lethal. I found him surprisingly well informed on current world politics. Even on the long march, it seems, the Reds received news broadcasts by radio, and in the Northwest they published their own newspaper. Mao was exceptionally well read in world history, and had a realistic conception of European social and political conditions. He was very interested in the Labour Party of England, and questioned me intensely about its present policies, soon exhausting all my information. It seemed to me that he found it difficult fully to understand why, in a country where workers were enfranchised, there was still a no-workers government. I was afraid my answers did not satisfy him. He expressed profound contempt for Ramsay MacDonald, whom he designated as a Han Jian, an arch-traitor of the British people. His opinion of President Roosevelt was rather interesting. He believed him to be anti-fascist and thought China could cooperate with such a man. He asked innumerable questions about the New Deal and Roosevelt's foreign policy, the questioning showed a remarkably clear conception of the objectives of both. He regarded Mussolini and Hitler as mountbanks, but considered Mussolini intellectually a much abler man, a real Machiavellian with a knowledge of history, while Hitler was a mere willless puppet of the reactionary capitalists. Mao had read a number of books about India and had some definite opinions on that country. Chief among these was that Indian independence would never be realized without an agrarian revolution. He questioned me about Gandhi, Nehru, and other Indian leaders I had known, he knew something about the black question in America and unfavorably compared the treatment of blacks and American Indians with policies in the Soviet Union towards national minorities. He was interested when I pointed out certain great differences in the historical backgrounds of the black person in America and that of minorities in Russia. Mao was an ardent student of philosophy. Once, when I was having nightly interviews with him on communist history, a visitor bought him several new books on philosophy, and Mao asked me to postpone our engagements. He consumed those books in three or four nights of intensive reading, during which he seemed oblivious to everything else. He had not confined his reading to Marxist philosophers, but also knew something of the ancient Greeks, of Spinoza, Kant, Goethe, Hegel, Rousseau, and others. I often wondered about Mao's own sense of responsibility over the question of force, violence, and the necessity of killing. In his youth, he had strongly liberal and humanistic tendencies, and the transition from idealism to realism evidently had first been made philosophically. Although he was peasant-born, he did not as a youth personally suffer much from the oppression of the landlords, as did many Reds, and although Marxism was the core of his thought, I deduced that class hatred for him was probably an intellectually acquired mechanism in the bulwark of his philosophy, rather than an instinctive impulse towards action. But there seemed to be nothing in him that might be called religious feeling. He was a humanist in a fundamental sense, he believed in man's ability to solve man's problems. I thought he had probably, on the whole, been a moderating influence in the communist movement where life and death were concerned. Mao worked 13 or 14 hours a day, often until very late at night, frequently retiring at 2 or 3. He seemed to have an iron constitution that he traced to a youth spent in hard work on his father's farm, and to an austere period in his school days when he had formed a kind of Spartan club with some comrades. They used to fast, go on long hikes in wooded hills of South China, swim in the coldest weather, walk shirtless in the rain and sleet, to toughen themselves. 
They intuitively knew that the years ahead in China would demand the capacity for withstanding great hardship and suffering. Mao once spent a summer tramping all over Hunan, his native province. He earned his bread by working from farm to farm, and sometimes by begging. Another time, he for days ate nothing but hard beans and water. Again, a process of toughening his stomach. The friendships he made on country rambles in his early youth were of great value to him when, some ten years later, he began to organize thousands of farmers in Hunan into the famous peasant unions which became the first base of the Soviets after the Guomindang broke with the communists in 1927. Mao impressed me as a man of considerable depth of feeling. I remember that his eyes moistened once or twice when he was speaking of dead comrades or recalling incidents in his youth. During the rice riots and famines of Hunan, when some starving peasants were beheaded in his province for demanding food from the Yaman. One soldier told me of seeing Mao give his coat away to a wounded man at the front. They said that he refused to wear shoes when the Red Warriors had none. Yet I doubted very much if he would ever command great respect from the intellectual elite of China, perhaps not entirely because he had an extraordinary mind, but because he had the personal habits of a peasant. The Chinese disciples of Parato might have thought him uncouth, Talking with Mao one day, I saw him absent-mindedly turn down the belt of his trousers and search for some guests, but then it is just possible that Parato might have done a little searching himself if he had lived in similar circumstances. But I am sure that Parato would never have taken off his trousers in the presence of the president of the Red Army University, as Mao did once when I was interviewing Lim Biao. It was extremely hot inside the little cave. Mao lay down on the bed, pulled off his pants, and for twenty minutes carefully studied a military map on the wall interrupted occasionally by Lin Biao, who asked for confirmations of dates and names, which Mao invariably knew. His nonchalant habits fitted with his complete indifference to personal appearance. Although the means were at hand to fix himself up like a chocolate box general or a politician's picture in Who's Who in China. Except for a few weeks, when he was ill, he walked most of the 6,000 miles of the Long March, like the rank and file. He could have achieved high office and riches by betraying to the Guomindang, and this applied to most Red Commanders. The tenacity with which these communists for ten years clung to their principles could not be fully evaluated unless one knew the history of silver bullets in China, by means of which other rebels were bought off. I was able to check up on many of Mao's assertions, and usually found them to be correct. He subjected me to mild doses of political propaganda, but it was interesting compared to what I had received in the non-bandit quarters. He never imposed any censorship on me, in either my writing or my photography, courtesies for which I was grateful. He did his best to see that I got facts to explain various aspects of Soviet life. 2. Basic Communist Policies What were the fundamental policies of the Chinese Reds? I had a dozen or more talks on this subject with Mao Zedong and other leading communists, but before one examined their policies it was necessary to have some conception of the nature of the long struggle between the communists and Nanjing. To comprehend even the recent events in the reddening northwest, one had to first look at a few facts of history, as they looked to Chinese communists. In the following paragraphs, I've paraphrased in part the comments of Ruofu, or Zhang Wentian, the English-speaking general secretary of the Communist Party Politburo, who I interviewed in Baoan. The Chinese Communist Party was founded only in 1921, an event reserved for more detailed discussion in a later context. It grew rapidly until 1923, when a two-party alliance was formed with Dr. Sun Yat-sen's Kuomintang, commonly called the Nationalist Party. Dr. Sun had independently reached an entente with the Russian Communist Party under Lenin, which offered Sun material and political help. Neither the Gongchandan, the Chinese Communist Party, nor the Kuomintang held power at the time, but Sun was supported by provincial warlords in South China. They permitted Sun to set up a provisional all-China government in Guangdong, in rivalry to the Beijing government, which was backed by a coterie of northern warlords and was recognised by the foreign powers. From 1923 onward, the Guomindang was reorganised with the help of Russian political advisers along the lines of the party of Lenin. With Sun's concurrence, some members of the Young Chinese Communist Party also joined the Guomindang. Sun Yat-sen was a nationalist patriot whose ambition was to recover China's sovereign independence. Beyond that, his concepts of social revolution, as expressed in his Three Principles of the People, were a vague mixture of reform capitalism and socialism. The communists supported Sun's nationalist independence aspirations, but they aimed ultimately at a proletarian dictatorship. Moscow had first, from 1918 to 1922, tried to advance Russian revolutionary interests in the Far East by working with the Beijing warlords. 
In 1921-1922, the Comintern reassessed the value of potential allies in China after its delegate, Henricus Snevliet, returned with a favourable report on the prospects of Dr Sun Yat-sen. Completely disillusioned after the Western rejection of his plans at the Washington Conference from 1921-22 to for the international development of China, Dr Sun now welcomed Russian offers of aid extended through the Comintern's agent, Adolf Joffa. A complete reorientation of Soviet policy began with the Sun Joffa Agreement. In the Sun Joffa Joint Statement, which was issued on January the 26th of 1923, which became the basis of the three-way alliance between the Guomindang Chinese Communist Party and the Soviet Russians, it was agreed that conditions do not exist here, in China, for the successful establishment of communism or socialism, while the chief and immediate aim of China is the achievement of national union and national independence, in the struggle for which the Chinese could depend on the aid of Russia. When Mikhail Borodin arrived in Guangdong late in 1922 to become Sun's advisor and head of the Soviet mission, he held dual positions as the delegate of the Soviet Politburo and as delegate to the Comintern, itself already an instrument of Soviet foreign policy. Inherent in this dualism from the outset were contradictions between Russian national interests and the interests of the Chinese Communist Party, which were never resolved. The durability of the alliance, as far as Chinese Communists were concerned, depended on the continued acceptance by the Guomindang of two major objectives. The first recognized the necessity for an anti-imperialist policy, the recovery of complete political, territorial, and economic sovereignty by revolutionary action. The second demanded an internal policy of anti-feudalism and anti-militarism, the overthrow of landlords and warlords, and the construction of new forms of social, economic, and political life, which both the communists and the Guomindang agreed must be democratic in character. Democratic was a word used by Dr. Sun to cover his paternalistic concept of a revolution in which the people, or masses, were to achieve modernization under the tutelage of his nationalist party. For the communists, the concept was a bourgeois democratic revolution that could be manipulated by stages towards socialism under the hegemony of their party. The two-party government formed in Guangdong consisted only of members of the Central Executive Committee of the Guomindang, which from 1924 to 1927 included communists. It was never more legal or democratic than its own organic structure. Communist membership in Guomindang's central organs was limited to one-third of the total. The communists regarded the successful fulfilment of Dr. Sun's bourgeois democratic revolution as a necessary preliminary to the socialist society later to be established. Their position in support of a democratic national independence and liberation movement seemed logical. Dr. Sun Yat-sen died in 1925 before the revolution was completed. Cooperation between the Guomindang and the Gongshandan came to an end in 1927. From the communist viewpoint, the nationalist revolution could also be said to have ended then, the right wing of the Guomindang, dominated by the new militarism and supported by certain foreign powers, the treaty port bankers and the landlords, broke away from the left Guomindang government in Hankou. It formed a regime at Nanjing under Jiang Kai-shek, which the communists and the majority of the Guomindang at that time regarded as counter-revolutionary, that is, against the bourgeois democratic revolution itself. The Guomindang soon reconciled itself to the Nanjing coup d'etat, but communism became a crime punishable by death. What the Reds conceived to be the two main points of nationalism, the anti-imperialist movement and the democratic revolution, were in practice abandoned. Militarist civil wars and later intensive war against the rising agrarian revolution ensued. Many thousands of communists and former peasant union and labor leaders were killed. The unions were suppressed, an enlightened dictatorship made war on all forms of opposition. Even so, Quite a number of communists survived in the army, and the party held together throughout a period of great terrorism. In 1937, despite the expenditure of billions of dollars in civil war against them, the Red Armies occupied in the northwest the largest, though sparsely populated, connected territory ever under their complete control. Of course, the Reds believed that the decade of history since 1927 had richly validated their thesis that national independence and democracy, which the Guomindang also set as its objective, could not be achieved in China without an anti-imperialist policy externally and an agrarian revolution internally. To see why communism steadily increased its following, especially among patriotic youth, and why at the moment it still projected upon the screen of history the shadows of great upheaval and change in the Orient, one had to note its main contentions. What were they? First of all, the Reds argued that after Nanjing split the living forces of the revolution, China rapidly lost much ground. Compromise followed compromise. 
The failure to realise agrarian reforms resulted in widespread discontent and open rebellion from the rural population in many parts of the country. General conditions of poverty and distress among the rural populace seriously worsened. China now had some passable motor roads, an excellent fleet of aeroplanes, and a new life movement, but reports came in daily of catastrophes which in China were considered more or less routine. Even as I was writing this chapter, for example, the press brought this appalling news from central and western China. Famine conditions continue to be reported in Henan, Anhui, Shanxi, Gansu, Sichuan, and Guizhou. Quite evidently, the country faces one of the most severe famines of many years, and thousands have already died. A recent survey by the Sichuan Famine Relief Commission discovered that 30 million people are now in the famine belt of that province, where Bark and Goddess of Mercy Earth are being consumed by tens of thousands. There are said to be over 400,000 famine refugees in Xianxi, over 1 million in Gansu, some 7 million in Honan, and 3 million in Guizhou. The famine in Guizhou is admitted by the official central news to be the most serious in a hundred years, affecting 60 districts of the province. Sichuan was one of the provinces where taxes had been collected for 60 years or more in advance, and thousands of acres of land had been abandoned by farmers unable to pay rents and outrageous loan interest. In my files were items collected over a period of six years, showing comparable distress in many other provinces. There were few signs that the rate of frequency of these calamities was diminishing. While the mass of the rural population was rapidly going bankrupt, concentration of land and wealth in the hands of a small number of landlords and landowning usurers increased in proportion to the general decline of independent farming. Sir Frederick Leith Ross was reported to have said that there was no middle class in China, only the incredibly poor and the very rich. Enormous taxes, the sharecrop method, and the whole historical system of social, political, and economic relationships described by Dr. Carl August Wittfogel as the Asiatic model of production contrived to leave the landless peasantry constantly heavily in debt, without reserves, and unable to meet such crises as drought, famine, and flood. Mao Zedong, when a secretary of the Guomindang's Committee on the Peasant Movement in 1926 and a candidate to the Central Executive Committee of the Guomindang, supervised the collection of land statistics for areas in 21 provinces. He asserted that this investigation indicated that resident landlords, rich peasants, officials, absentee landlords and usurers, about 10% of the whole rural population, together owned over 70% of the cultivable land in China. About 15% was owned by middle peasants, but over 65% of the rural population, made up of poor peasants, tenants, and farm workers, owned only from 10 to 15% of the total arable land. These statistics were suppressed after the counter-revolution, according to Mao. Now, 10 years later, it is still impossible to get any statement from Nanjing on land distribution in China. The communists alleged that rural bankruptcy had been accelerated by the Guomindang's policy of non-resistance to imperialism, in particular Japanese imperialism. As a result of Nanjing's no-war policy against Japan, China had lost to Japanese invaders about a fifth of her national territory, over 40% of her railway mileage, 85% of her unsettled lands, and a large part of her coal, 80% of her iron deposits, 37% of her finest forest lands, and about 40% of her national export trade. Japan now controlled over 75% of the total pig iron and iron mining enterprises of what remained of China, and over half of the textile industry of China. The conquest of Manchuria also robbed China of its own best market, as well as its most accessible raw materials. In 1931, Manchuria took more than 27% of its total imports from other Chinese provinces. But in 1935, China could sell Manchukuo only 4% of those imports. It presented Japan with the region of China best suited for industrial development, and enabled her to prevent that development and shuttle the raw materials to her own industries. It gave to Japan the continental base from which she could inexorably continue her aggression in China. Such changes, many felt, completely wiped out the benefits of any reforms that Nanjing might be able to claim to its credit for generations in the future, even provided the rest of China remained intact. And what was achieved by Nanjing's nine years of war against the Reds? The Northwest Junta had recently summarized the results in a manifesto opposing preparations for the sixth anti-Red final annihilation drive. It reminded us that Manchuria had gone to Japan during one final annihilation drive, Shanghai had been invaded during another, Jiahol had been given up during the third, East Hubei lost during still another, and the sovereignty of Hubei and Chaha provinces had been badly impaired during the fifth remnant bandit extermination. Of course, Nanjing could not stop civil war as long as the Reds continued to attempt to overthrow the government by force. 
In April 1932, when the Chinese Soviet Republic declared war against Japan, it had offered to combine with anti-Japanese elements. Again, in January 1933, it had proposed to unite with any armed force in a united front from below. There was no real offer, however, to compromise with Chiang Kai-shek. By mid-1936, the communists and the Comintern had radically changed their position. In a search for broad national unity, they included the Guomindang and even Chiang Kai-shek. The Chinese Communist Party now promised to unite its Red Army and the Soviet districts under the sovereignty of the Guomindang central government, provided that the latter would agree to establish democratic representative government, resist Japan, enfranchise the people, and guarantee civil liberties to the masses. In other words, the Reds were ready to remarry the Guomindang if it would return to the bourgeois nationalist program of anti-imperialism and anti-feudalism. But of these two basic aims, they realised that the fight for national survival was paramount and must be conducted even at the expense of modifying the internal struggle over the land question. That class antagonisms might have to be sublimated in certainly could not be satisfied without the successful solution of the external struggle against Japan. To quote Mao in his interview with me, The fundamental issue before the Chinese people today is the struggle against Japanese imperialism. Our Soviet policy is decisively conditioned by this struggle. Japan's warlords hope to subjugate the whole of China and make of the Chinese people their colonial slaves. To fight against the Japanese invasion, the fight against Japanese economic and military conquest, these are the main tasks that must be remembered in analyzing Soviet policies. Japanese imperialism is not only the enemy of China, but also of all people of the world who desire peace. Especially, it is the enemy of those peoples with interests in the Pacific Ocean, namely the American, British, French, and Soviet Russian nations. The Japanese continental policy, as well as naval policy, is directed not only against China, but also against those countries. What do we expect from the foreign powers? We expect at least that friendly nations will not help the Japanese imperialists and will adopt a neutral position. We hope that they will actively help China to resist invasion and conquest. In using the word imperialism, the communists sharply distinguished between Japan and friendly, non-aggressive democratic capitalist powers. Mao Zedong explained, Concerning the question of imperialism in general, we observe that among the great powers, some express unwillingness to engage in a new world war. Some are not ready to see Japan occupy China. Countries such as America, Great Britain, France, Holland, and Belgium. Then there are countries permanently under the menace of the aggressive powers, such as Siam, the Philippines, Central American countries, Canada, India, Australia, and the Dutch Indies, etc., all more or less under the direct threat of Japan. We consider them our friends and invite their cooperation. So, except for Japan and those countries which help Japanese imperialism, the categories mentioned above can be organized into anti-war, anti-aggression, anti-fascist world alliances. In the past, Nanjing has received much help from America, England, and other countries. Most of these funds and supplies have been used in civil war. For every red soldier killed, Nanjing has slain many peasants and workers. According to a recent article by the banker Zhang Naizhi, it has cost the Chinese people about $80,000 for every red soldier killed by Nanjing. Such help, therefore, does not seem to us to have been rendered to the Chinese people. Only when Nanjing determines to cease civil war and fight against Japanese imperialism and unites with the People's Revolution to organize a democratic national defense government, only then can such help be of real benefit to the Chinese nation. I asked Mao whether the Soviets were in favor of cancelling unequal treaties. He pointed out that many of those unequal treaties had in effect already been destroyed by the Japanese, especially in the case of Manchuria. But as for the future attitude of a representative government in China, he declared, For those powers that help or do not oppose China in her war of independence and liberation should be invited to enjoy close friendly relations with China. Those powers which actively assist Japan should naturally not be given the same treatment. For example, Germany and Italy, which have already established special relations with Manchukuo and cannot be regarded as powers friendly to the Chinese people. With friendly powers, China will peacefully negotiate treaties of mutual advantage. With other powers, China is prepared to maintain cooperation on a much broader scale. So far as Japan is concerned, China must, by the act of war of liberation, cancel all unequal treaties, confiscate all Japanese imperialist holdings, and annul Japan's special privileges, concessions, and influence in this country. Concerning our relations with other powers, we communists do not advocate any measure that may place at disadvantage the world position of China in her struggle against Japanese imperialism. 
when China really wins her independence, then legitimate foreign trading interests will enjoy more opportunities than ever before. The power of production and consumption of 450 million people is not a matter that can remain the exclusive interest of the Chinese, but one that must engage the many nations. Our millions of people once really emancipated with their great latent productive possibilities freed for creative activity in every field can help improve the economy as well as raise the cultural level of the whole world. But the productive power of the Chinese people has in the past scarcely been touched. On the contrary, it has been suppressed, both by native militarists and Japanese imperialism. Finally, I asked, is it possible for China to make anti-imperialist alliances with democratic capitalist powers? Anti-imperialist, anti-fascist alliances, replied Mao, are in the nature of peace alliances and for mutual defense against war-making nations. A Chinese anti-fascist pact with capitalist democracies is perfectly possible and desirable. It is to the interest of such countries to join the anti-fascist front in self-defense. If China should be completely colonized, it would mean the beginning of a long series of terrible and senseless wars. A choice must be made. For itself, the Chinese people will take the road of struggle against its oppressors. We hope also that the statesmen and people of foreign nations will march with us on this road, and not follow the dark paths laid by the bloody history of imperialism. To oppose Japan successfully, China must also seek assistance from other powers. This does not mean, however, that China is incapable of fighting Japan without foreign help. The Chinese Communist Party, the Soviet government, the Red Army, and the Chinese people are ready to unite with any power to shorten the duration of this war. But if none joins us, we are determined to carry on alone. Did the Reds really imagine that China could defeat Japan's mighty war machine? I believe that they did. What was the peculiar shape of logic on which they based their assumption of triumph? It was one of dozens of questions I put to Mao Zedong. 3. On War with Japan On July the 16th of 1936, I sat on a square backless stool inside Mao Zedong's residence. It was after nine at night. Taps had been sounded and nearly all lights were out. The walls and ceiling of Mao's home were of solid rock. Beneath was a flooring of bricks. Cotton gauze extended halfway up windows also hollowed from stone, and candles sputtered on the square, unpainted table before us. Spread with a clean, red felt cloth, Mrs. Mao was in an adjoining room making compote from wild peaches purchased that day from a fruit merchant. Mao sat with his legs crossed in a deep shelf hewn from the solid rock, and smoked a Tianmen cigarette. Seated next to me was Wu Liang Bing, a young Soviet functionary who acted as interpreter in my formal interviews with Mao Zedong. I wrote down in full, in English, Mao Zedong's answers to my questions, and these were then translated into Chinese and corrected by Mao, who is noted for his insistence upon accuracy of detail. With the insistence of Mr. Wu, the interviews were retranslated into English, and because of such precautions, I believe these pages to contain few errors of reporting. They were, of course, the strictly partisan views of the leader of the Chinese Communists, views being made known to the Western world for the first time. Wu Liang Bing, to whom I am indebted for much assistance in gathering material, was the son of a rich landlord in Fenghua, Chiang Kai-shek's native district in Zhejiang. He had fled from there some years ago when his father, apparently an ambitious Burha, wished to betroth him to a relative of the Generalissimo. Wu was a graduate of Daxia University in Shanghai. There, Patrick Givens, chief of the criminal investigation department of the British-controlled police of the international settlement, had arrested Wu Liangbing. Charged with communist activity, Wu spent two years in the settlement's Ward Road jail. He had studied in France, England, and Russia, was 26 years old, and for his energetic labours as a communist received his uniform, room, and food, the latter consisting chiefly of millet and noodles. Mao began to answer my first question about communist policy towards Japan, which was this. If Japan is defeated and driven from China, do you think that the major problem of foreign imperialism will in general have been solved here? Yes, if other imperialist countries do not act like Japan, and if China defeats Japan, it will mean that the Chinese masses have awakened, have mobilized, and have established their independence. Therefore, the main problem of imperialism will have been solved. Under what conditions do you think the Chinese people can exhaust and defeat the forces of Japan, I asked. He replied, Three conditions will guarantee our success. First, the achievement of the National United Front against Japanese imperialism in China. Second, the formation of a world anti-Japanese United Front. Thirdly, revolutionary action from the oppressed peoples at present suffering under Japanese imperialism. Of these, the central necessity is the union of the Chinese people themselves. My question, how long do you think such a war would last? 
Mao's answer. That depends on the strength of the Chinese People's Front, many conditioning factors in China and Japan, and the degree of international help given to China, as well as the rate of revolutionary development in Japan. If the Chinese People's Front is powerfully homogenous, if it is effectively organised horizontally and vertically, if the international aid to China is considerable from those governments which recognise the menace of Japanese imperialism to their own interests, if revolution comes quickly in Japan, the war will be short and victory speedily won. If these conditions are not realised, however, the war will be very long, but in the end, just the same, Japan will be defeated, only the sacrifices will be extensive and it will be a painful period for the whole world. Question. What is your opinion of the profitable course of development of such a war, politically and militarily? Answer. Two questions are involved here, the policy of the foreign powers and the strategy of China's armies. Now the Japanese continental policy is already fixed and is well known. Those who imagine that by further sacrifices of Chinese sovereignty, by making economic, political or territorial compromises and concessions, they can halt the advance of Japan, are only indulging in utopian fancy. Nanjing has in the past adopted erroneous policies based on this strategy, and we have only to look at the map of East Asia to see the results of it. But we know well enough that not only North China but the lower Yangtze Valley and our southern seaports are already included in the Japanese continental program. Moreover, it is just as clear that the Japanese Navy aspires to blockade the China Seas and seize the Philippines, Siam, Indochina, Malaya and the Dutch East Indies. In the event of war, Japan will try to make them her strategic bases, cutting off Great Britain, France and America from China, and monopolising the seas of the southern Pacific. These moves are included in Japan's plans of naval strategy, copies of which we have seen, and such navy strategy will be coordinated by the land strategy of Japan. Many people think it would be impossible for China to continue her fight against Japan once the latter had seized certain strategic points on the coast and enforced a blockade. This is nonsense. To refute it, we have only to refer to the history of the Red Army. In certain periods, our forces have been exceeded numerically some 10 or 20 times by the Guomindang troops, which were also superior to us in equipment. Their economic resources many times surpassed ours, and they received material assistance from the outside. Why then has the Red Army scored success after success against the white troops, and not only survived till today, but increased its power. The explanation is that the Red Army and the Soviet government had created among all people within their areas a rock-like solidarity, because everyone in the Soviets was ready to fight for his government against the oppressors, because every person was voluntarily and consciously fighting for his own interests and what he believed to be right. Second, in the struggle of the Soviets, the people were led by men of ability, strength and determination, equipped with deep understanding of the strategic, political, economic and military needs of their position. The Red Army won its many victories, beginning with only a few dozen rifles in the hands of determined revolutionaries, because its solid base and the people attracted friends even among the white troops as well as among the civilian populace. The enemy was infinitely superior militarily, but politically it was immobilized. In the anti-Japanese war, the Chinese people would have on their side greater advantages than those the Red Army has utilised in its struggle with the Guomindang. China is a very big nation, and it cannot be said to be conquered until every inch of it is under the sword of the invader. If Japan should succeed in occupying even a large section of China, getting possession of an area with as many as 100 or even 200 million people, we would still be far from defeated. We would still have left a great force to fight against Japan's warlords, who would also have to fight a heavy and constant rearguard action throughout the entire war. As for munitions, the Japanese cannot seize our arsenals in the interior, which are sufficient to equip Chinese armies for many years, nor can they prevent us from capturing great amounts of arms and ammunition from their own hands. By the latter method, the Red Army has equipped its present forces from the Guomindang. For nine years they have been our ammunition carriers. What infinitely greater possibilities would open up for the utilisation of such tactics as won our arms for us if the whole Chinese people were united against Japan? Economically, of course, China is not unified, but the uneven development of China's economy also prevents advantages in a war against the highly centralised and highly concentrated economy of Japan. For example, to sever Shanghai from the rest of China is not as disastrous to the country as would be, for instance, the severance of New York from the rest of America. Moreover, it is impossible for Japan to isolate all of China. China's northwest, southwest, and west cannot be blockaded by Japan. Thus, once more, the central point of the problem becomes the mobilization and unification of the entire Chinese people, and the building up of a united front, such as been advocated by the Chinese Communist Party ever since 1932. Question. In the event of a Sino-Japanese war, 
Do you think there will be a revolution in Japan? Answer. The Japanese revolution is not only a possibility but a certainty. It is inevitable and will begin to occur promptly after the first severe defeats suffered by the Japanese army. Question. Do you think Soviet Russia and outer Mongolia would become involved in this war and would come to the assistance of China? Under what circumstances is that likely? Answer. Of course, the Soviet Union is also not an isolated country. It cannot ignore the events in the Far East. It cannot remain passive. Will it complacently watch Japan conquer all of China and make of it a strategic base from which to attack the USSR? Or will it help the Chinese people to oppose their Japanese oppressors, win their independence, and establish friendly relations with the Russian people? We think Russia will choose the latter course. We believe that once the Chinese people have their own government and begin this war of resistance and want to establish friendly alliances with the USSR, as well as other friendly powers, the Soviet Union will be in the vanguard to shake hands with us. The struggle against Japanese imperialism is a world task, and the Soviet Union, as part of that world, can no more remain neutral than can England or America. Question. Is it the immediate task of the Chinese people to regain all the territories lost to Japanese imperialism, or only to drive Japan from North China and all Chinese territory beyond the Great Wall? Answer. It is the immediate task of China to regain all our lost territories, not merely to defend our sovereignty south of the Great Wall. This means that Manchuria must be regained. We do not, however, include Korea, formerly a Chinese colony, but when we have re-established the independence of the lost territories of China, and if the Koreans wish to break away from the chains of Japanese imperialism, we will extend them our enthusiastic help in their struggle for independence. The same thing applies for Taiwan. As in a Mongolia, which is populated by both Chinese and Mongolians, we will struggle to drive Japan from there and help Inner Mongolia to establish an autonomous state. Question. In actual practice, how could the Soviet government and the Red Army cooperate with the Guomindang armies in a war against Japan? In a foreign war, it would be necessary for all Chinese armies to be placed under a centralized command. Would the Red Army agree, if allowed representation on a Supreme War Council, to submit to its decisions both militarily and politically? Answer. Yes. Our government will wholeheartedly submit to the decisions of such a council, provided it really resists Japan. Question. Would the Red Army agree not to move its troops into or against any areas occupied by Guomindang armies, except with the consent or at the order of the Supreme War Council? Answer. Yes, certainly we will not move our troops into any areas occupied by anti-Japanese armies, nor have we done so for some time past. The Red Army would not utilize any wartime situation in an opportunist way. Question. What demands would the Communist Party make in return for such cooperation? Answer. It would insist upon waging war, decisively and finally, against Japanese aggression. In addition, it would request the observance of points advanced in the calls for a democratic republic and the establishment of a national defense government. Question. How can the people best be armed, organized, and trained to participate in such a war? Answer. The people must be given the right to organize and arm themselves. This is a freedom which Chiang Kai-shek has in the past denied to them. The suppression has not, however, been entirely successful, as, for example, in the case of the Red Army. Also, despite severe repression in Beijing, Shanghai, and other places, the students have begun to organize themselves and have already prepared themselves politically. But still, the students in the revolutionary anti-Japanese masses have not yet got their freedom, cannot be mobilized, cannot be trained and armed. When the contrary is true, the masses are given economic, social, and political freedom. Their strength will be intensified hundreds of times, and the true power of the nation will be revealed. The Red Army, through its own struggle, has won its freedom from the militarists to become an unconquerable power. The anti-Japanese volunteers have won their freedom of action from the Japanese oppressors, and have armed themselves in a similar way. If the Chinese people are trained, armed, and organized, they can likewise become an invincible force. Question. What, in your opinion, should be the main strategy and tactics to be followed in this war of liberation? Answer. The strategy should be that of a war of maneuver, over an extended, shifting, and indefinite front, a strategy depending for success on a high degree of mobility in difficult terrain, and featured by swift attack and withdrawal, swift concentration and dispersal. It will be a large-scale war of maneuver rather than the simple positional war of extensive trench work, deep massed lines, and heavy fortifications. Our strategy and tactics must be conditioned by the theatre in which the war will take place, and this dictates a war of maneuver. This does not mean the abandonment of strategic points, which can be defended in positional warfare as long as profitable, 
but the pivotal strategy must be a war of manoeuvre, and important reliance must be placed on guerrilla and partisan tactics. Fortified warfare must be utilised, but it will be of an auxiliary and secondary strategic importance. Here it must be inserted that this sort of strategy in general seemed to be rather widely supported, also among non-communist Chinese military leaders. Nanjing's wholly imported air force provided an impressive if costly internal police machine, but few experts had illusions about its long-ranged value in foreign war. Both the air force and such mechanization as had taken place in the Central Army were looked upon by many as costly toys incapable of retaining a role of initiative after the first few weeks, since China lacked the industries necessary to maintain and replenish either an air force or other highly technical branch of modern warfare. Bai Zhongxi, Li Congren, Han Fu Zhu, Hu Tangnan, Zhen Zheng, Zhang Xueliang, Feng Yuxiang, Cai Dingkai were among the leading nationalist generals who seemed to share Mao's conviction that China's sole hope of victory against Japan must ultimately rest on superior maneuvering of great masses of troops, divided into mobile units, and the ability to maintain a protracted defense over immense partisan areas. Mao Zedong continued, Geographically, the theater of the war is so vast that it is possible for us to pursue mobile warfare with the utmost efficiency and with a telling effect on a slow-moving war machine like Japan's, cautiously feeling its way in front of fierce rearguard actions, deep concentration, and the exhausting defense of a vital position or two on a narrow front would be to throw away all the tactical advantages of our geography and economic organization, and to repeat the mistake of the Abyssinians. Our strategy and tactics must aim to avoid great decisive battles in the early stages of the war, and gradually to break the morale, the fighting spirit, and the military efficiency of the living forces of the enemy. Besides the regular Chinese troops, we should create, direct, and politically and militarily equip great numbers of partisans and guerrilla detachments among the peasantry. What has been accomplished by the anti-Japanese volunteer units of this type in Manchuria is only a very minor demonstration of the latent power of resistance that can be mobilized from the revolutionary peasantry of all China. Properly led and organized, such units can keep the Japanese busy 24 hours a day and worry them to death. It must be remembered that the war will be fought inside China, this means that the Japanese will be entirely surrounded by a hostile Chinese people. The Japanese will be forced to move in all their provisions and guard them, maintaining troops along all lines of communications, and heavily garrisoning their bases in Manchuria and Japan as well. The process of the war will present to China the possibility of capturing many Japanese prisoners, arms, ammunition, war machines, and so forth. A point will be reached where it will become more and more possible to engage Japan's armies on a basis of positional warfare, using fortifications and deep entrenchment, for, as the war progresses, the technical equipment of the anti-Japanese forces will greatly improve and will be reinforced by important foreign help. Japan's economy will crack under the strain of a long, expensive occupation of China, and the morale of her forces will break under the trial of war of innumerable but indecisive battles. The great reservoirs of human material in the revolutionary Chinese people will still be pouring men ready to fight for their freedom into the front lines, long after the tidal flood of Japanese imperialism has wrecked itself on the hidden reefs of Chinese resistance. All these and other factors will condition the war and enable us to make the final and decisive attacks on Japan's fortifications and strategic bases, and to drive Japan's army of occupation from China. Japanese officers and soldiers captured and disarmed by us will be welcomed and will be well treated. They will not be killed, they will be treated in a brotherly way, Every method will be adopted to make the Japanese proletarian soldiers, with whom we have no quarrel, stand up and oppose their own fascist oppressors. Our slogan will be, unite and oppose the common oppressors, the fascist leaders. Anti-fascist Japanese troops are our friends, and there is no conflict in our aims. It was past two o'clock in the morning, and I was exhausted, but I could see no signs of fatigue on Mao's thoughtful face. He alternately walked up and down between the two little rooms, sat down, lay down, leaned on the table, and read from a sheaf of reports in the intervals when Wu translated and I wrote. Mrs. Mao also was still awake. Suddenly both of them bent over and gave an exclamation of delight at a moth that had languished beside the candle. It was a really lovely thing, with wings shaded a delicate apple green and fringed in a soft rainbow of saffron and rose. Mao opened a book and pressed this gossamer of colour between its leaves. Could such people really be thinking seriously of war? Four. Two million dollars in heads. There were many things unique about the Red Army University. Its president was a 28-year-old army commander who, communists said, had never lost a battle. It boasted, in one class of undergraduates, 
veteran warriors whose average age was 27, with an average eight years of fighting experience and three wounds each. Was there any other school where paper shortage made it necessary to use the blank sides of enemy propaganda leaflets for classroom notebooks? Or where the cost of educating each cadet, including food, clothing, all institutional expenses, was less than $15 silver per month? Or where the aggregate value of rewards offered for the heads of various notorious cadets exceeded $2 million? Firstly, it was probably the world's only seat of higher learning whose classrooms were bomb-proof caves, with chairs and desks of stone and brick, and blackboards and walls of limestone and clay. In Shanxi and Gansu, besides ordinary houses, there were great cave dwellings, temple grottoes, and castled battlements hundreds of years old. Wealthy officials and landlords built these queer edifices a thousand years ago to guard against flood and invasion and famine, and here hoarded the grain and treasure to see them through sieges of each. Many vaulted chambers cut deeply into the loess or solid rock, some with rooms that held several hundred people. These cliff dwellings made perfect bomb shelters. In such archaic manners, the Red University found strange but safe accommodation. Lin Biao, the president, was introduced to me soon after my arrival, and he invited me to speak one day to his cadets. He suggested the topic, British and American policies toward China. When he arranged a noodle dinner for the occasion, it was too much for me and I succumbed. Lin Biao was the son of a factory owner in Hubei province and was born in 1908. His father was ruined by extortionate taxation, but Lin managed to get through prep school and became a cadet in the famous Wanbo Academy in Guangdong. There, he made a brilliant record. He received intensive political and military training under Jiang Kai-shek and Jiang's chief advisor, the Russian general Blucher. Soon after his graduation, the nationalist expedition began, and Lin Biao was promoted to a captaincy. By 1927, at the age of 20, he was a colonel in the noted 4th Guomindang Army under Jiang Fa Gui, and in August of that year, after the right coup d'etat in Nanjing, he led his regiment to join the 20th Army under He Lung and Ye Ding in the Nanchang Uprising, which began the communist armed struggle for power. With Mao Zedong, Lin Biao shared the distinction of being one of the few Red commanders never wounded, engaged on the front in more than a hundred battles, in field command for more than ten years, exposed to every hardship that his men had ever known, with a reward of $100,000 on his head. He was as yet unhurt. In 1932, Lin Biao was given command of the 1st Red Army Corps, which then numbered around 20,000 rifles, it became, according to general opinion among their Red Army officers, their most dreaded force, chiefly because of Lin's extraordinary talent as a tactician. The mere discovery that they were fighting the 1st Red Army Corps was said to have sometimes put a Nanjing army to rout. Like many able Red commanders, Lin had never been outside China, and spoke and read no language but Chinese. Before the age of 30, however, he had already won recognition beyond Red circles. His articles in the Chinese Red's military magazines, Struggle and War and Revolution, had been republished, studied, and criticized in Nanjing military journals, and also in Japan and Soviet Russia. He was noted as the originator of the short attack, a tactic on which General Feng Yuxiang had commented. To the Reds' skillful mastery of the short attack, many victories of the 1st Army Corps were said to be traceable. With Commander Lin and his faculty, I journeyed one morning a short distance beyond the walls of Baoan to the Red Army University. We arrived at recreation hour. Some of the cadets were playing basketball on the two courts set up, Others were playing tennis on a court laid down on the turf beside the Baoan River, a tributary of the Yellow River. Still other cadets were playing table tennis, writing, reading new books and magazines, or studying in their primitive club rooms. This was the first section of the university in which there were some 200 students. Altogether, Hongda, as the school was known in the Soviet districts, had four sections with over 800 students. There were also near Baoan and under administrative control of the education commissioner, radio, cavalry, agricultural, and medical training schools. There was a communist party school and a mass education training center. Over 200 cadets assembled to hear me explain British and American policies. I made a crude summary of Anglo-American attitudes and agreed to answer questions. It was a great mistake, I soon realized, and the noodle dinner hardly compensated for my embarrassment. What is the attitude of the British government toward the formation of the pro-Japanese Hebei Chaha Council? and the garrisoning of North China by Japanese troops. What are the results of the NRA policy in America, and how has it benefited the working class? Will Germany and Italy help Japan if war breaks out with China? How long do you think Japan can carry on a major war against China if she is not helped by other powers? Why has the League of Nations failed? 
Why is it that although the Communist Party is legal in both Great Britain and America, there is no workers' government in either country? What progress is being made in the formation of an anti-fascist front in England and America? What is the future of the international student movement, which has its centre in Paris? In your opinion, can Leith Ross's visit to Japan result in Anglo-Japanese agreement on policies toward China? When China begins to resist Japan, will America and Great Britain assist China or Japan? Please tell us why America and Great Britain keep their fleets and armed forces in China if they are friends of the Chinese people. What do the American and British workers think of the USSR? No small territory to cover in a two-hour question period. And it was not confined to two hours. Beginning at ten in the morning, it continued till late in the afternoon. Afterwards, I toured the various classrooms and talked with Lin Biao and his faculty. They told me something of the conditions of enrollment in their school, and showed me printed announcements of its courses, thousands of copies of which had been secretly distributed throughout China. The four sections of the academy invited all who are determined to fight Japanese imperialism and to offer themselves for the national revolutionary cause regardless of class, social, or political differences. The age limit was 16 to 28, regardless of sex. The applicants must be physically strong, free from epidemic diseases, and also, rather sweeping, free from all bad habits. In practice, I discovered most of the cadets in the first section were battalion, regimental, or division commanders, or political commissars of the Red Army, receiving advanced military and political training. According to Red Army regulations, every active commander or commissar was supposed to spend at least four months at such study during every two years of active service. The second and third sections included company, platoon, and squad commanders, experienced fighters in the Red Army, as well as new recruits selected from graduates of middle schools or the equivalent, unemployed teachers or officers, carders of anti-Japanese volunteer corps and anti-Japanese partisan leaders, and workers who have engaged in organising and leading labour movements. Over 60 middle school graduates from Shanxi had joined the Reds during their expedition to that province. Classes in the second and third sections lasted six months. The fourth section was devoted chiefly to training engineers, cavalry carders, and artillery units. Here I met some former machinists and apprentices. Later on, as I was leaving Red China, I was to meet, entering by truck, eight new recruits for the Bandit University arriving from Shanghai and Beijing. Lin Biao told me they had a waiting list of over 2,000 student applications from all parts of China. At that time, every cadet had to be smuggled in. The curriculum varied in different sections of Hongda. In the first section, political lectures included these courses. Political knowledge, problems of the Chinese Revolution, political economy, party construction, tactical problems of the Republic, Leninism and historical foundations of democracy, and political and social forces in Japan. Military courses included problems of strategy in the war with Japan, manoeuvring warfare against Japan, and the development of partisan warfare in the anti-Japanese war. Special textbooks had been prepared for some of these courses. Some were carried clear from the Soviet publishing house in Jiangxi, where, I was told, more than 800 printers were employed in the main plant. In other courses, the materials used were lectures by Red Army commanders and party leaders dealing with historical experiences of the Russian and Chinese revolutions, or utilising materials from captured government files, documents, and statistics. These courses at Hongda perhaps suggested a reply to the question, do the Reds really intend to fight Japan? It sufficed to show how the Reds foresaw and actively planned for China's war of independence against Japan, a war which they regarded as inevitable unless, by some miracle, Japan withdrew from the vast areas of China already under the wheels of Nippon's military juggernaut. That the Reds were fully determined to fight and believed the opening of the war should find them first on the front was indicated not only in the impassioned utterances of their leaders, in grim practical schooling in the army, and in their proposals for a united front with their ten-year enemy the Guomindang, but also by the intensive propagandizing one saw throughout the Soviet districts. Playing a leading part in this educative mission were the many companies of youths in the Renmin Kangzhi Zhu Shi, or People's Anti-Japanese Dramatic Society who travelled ceaselessly back and forth in the Red Districts, spreading the gospel of resistance and awakening the slumbering nationalism of the peasantry. It was to one of the performances of this astonishing children's theatre that I went soon after my first visit to the Red Army University. 5. Red Theatre People were already moving down toward the open-air stage, improvised from an old temple, when I set out with a young official who had invited me to the Red Theatre, it was Saturday, two or three hours before sunset, and all Baoan seemed to be going. Cadets, muleteers, women and girl workers from the uniform and shoe factory, clerks from the cooperatives and from the Soviet post office, 
soldiers, carpenters, villagers, followed by their infants, all began streaming toward the big grassy plain beside the river where the players were performing. It would be hard to imagine a more democratic gathering, something like an old-time chattaka. No tickets were sold, there was no dress circle, and there were no preferred seats. Goats were grazing on the tennis court not far beyond. I noticed Lo Fu, General Secretary of the Politburo of the Central Committee, Lin Biao, Lin Xu Han, the Commissioner of Finance, Chairman Mao Zedong, and other officials and their wives scattered throughout the crowd, seated on the springy turf like the rest. No one paid much attention to them once the performance had begun. Across the stage was a big pink curtain of silk with the words People's Anti-Japanese Dramatic Society, in Chinese characters as well as Latinized Chinese, which the Reds were promoting to hasten mass education. The program was to last three hours. It proved to be a combination of playlets, dancing, singing, and pantomime, a kind of variety show or vaudeville given unity chiefly by two central themes, anti-Nipponism and the revolution. It was full of overt propaganda and the props were primitive, but it had the advantage of being emancipated from cymbal clashing and falsetto singing, and of dealing with living material rather than with meaningless historical intrigues that are the concern of the decadent Chinese opera. What it lacked in subtlety and refinement, it partly made up by its robust vitality, its sparkling humour, and a sort of participation between actors and audience. Guests at the Red Theatre seemed actually to listen to what was said, a really astonishing thing in contrast with the bored opera audience who often spent their time eating fruit and melon seeds, gossiping, tossing hot towels back and forth, visiting from one box to another, and only occasionally looking at the stage. The first playlet was called Invasion. It opened in a Manchurian village in 1931 with the Japanese arriving and driving out the non-resisting Chinese soldiers. In the second scene, Japanese officers banqueted in a peasant's home, using Chinese men for chairs and drunkenly making love to their wives. Another scene showed Japanese dope peddlers selling morphine and heroin and forcing every peasant to buy a quantity. A youth who refused to buy was singled out for questioning. You don't buy morphine? You don't obey Manchu Kuo health rules? You don't love your divine emperor Pu Yi? Charged his tormentors. You are no good. You are an anti-Japanese bandit. And the youth was promptly executed. A scene in the village marketplace showed small merchants peacefully selling their wares. Suddenly Japanese soldiers arrived searching for more anti-Japanese bandits. Instantly they demanded passports and those who had forgotten them were shot. Then two Japanese officers gorged themselves on a peddler's pork. When he asked for payment, they looked at him in astonishment. You asked for payment? Why, Chiang Kai-shek gave us Manchuria, Jiehol, Chaha, and the Tanku Truce, the Houmutsu Agreement, and the Hubei Chaha Council, without asking for a single copper, and you want us to pay you for a little pork? Whereupon they impaled him as a bandit. In the end, of course, all that proved to be too much for the villagers. Merchants turned over their stands and umbrellas, farmers rushed forth with their spears, Women and children came with knives, and all swore to fight to the death against the Zhibengui, the Japanese devils. The little play was sprinkled with humour and logical idiom. Bursts of laughter alternated with oaths of disgust and hatred for the Japanese. The audience got quite agitated. It was not just political propaganda to them, nor slapstick melodrama, but the poignant truth itself. The fact that the players were mostly youths in their teens and natives of Shanxi and Shanxi seemed entirely forgotten in the onlooker's absorption with the ideas presented. The substratum of bitter reality behind this portrayal, done as a sort of farce, was not obscured by its wit and humour for at least one young soldier there. He stood up at the end, and in a voice shaking with emotion cried out, Death to the Japanese bandits! Down with the murderers of our Chinese people! Fight back to our homes! The whole assembly echoed his slogans mightily, I learned that this lad was a Manchurian whose parents had been killed by the Japanese. Comic relief was provided at this moment by the meandering goats. They were discovered nonchalantly eating the tennis net, which someone had forgotten to take down. A wave of laughter swept the audience while some cadets gave chase to the culprits and salvaged this important property of the recreation department. Second number on the program was a harvest dance, daintily performed by a dozen girls of the Dramatic Society, Barefoot, clad in peasant trousers and coats and fancy vests with silk bandanas on their heads, they danced with good union and grace. Two of these girls, I learned, had walked clear from Jiangxi, where they had learned to dance in the Red Dramatic School in Jiujiang. They had genuine talent. Another unique and amusing number was called the United Front Dance, which interpreted the mobilization of China to resist Japan. By what leisure domain they produced their costumes, I do not know, but suddenly there were groups of youths wearing sailors' white jumpers and caps and shorts, 
first appearing as cavalry formations, next as aviation corps, then as foot soldiers, and finally as the navy. Their pantomime and gesture, at which the Chinese are born artists, very realistically conveyed the spirit of the dance. Then there was something called the Dance of the Red Machines, by sound and gesture, by an interplay and interlocking of arms, legs and heads, the little dancers ingeniously interpreted the thrust and drive of pistons, the turn of cogs and wheels, the hum of dynamos, and visions of a machine-aged China of the future. Between acts, shouts arose for extempore singing by people in the audience. Half a dozen native Shanxi girls, workers in the factories, were by popular demand required to sing an old folk song of the province, accompaniment being furnished by a Shanxi farmer with his homemade guitar. Another command performance was given by a cadet who played the harmonica, and one was called upon to sing a favourite song of the Southland. Then, to my utter consternation, a demand began that the Waiguo Xinwen Dijue, the foreign newspaper man, strain his lungs in a solo of his own. They refused to excuse me. Alas, I could think of nothing but foxtrots, waltzes, la bohème, and ave maria, which all seemed inappropriate for this martial audience. I could not even remember the Marseillaise. The demand persisted. In extreme embarrassment, I at last rendered the man on the flying trapeze. They were very polite about it, but no encore was requested. With infinite relief, I saw the curtain go up on the next act, which turned out to be a social play with a revolutionary theme, an accountant falling in love with his landlord's wife. Then there was more dancing, a living newspaper dealing with some late news from the southwest, and a chorus of children singing the international. Here the flags of several nations were hung on streamers from a central illuminated column, round which reclined the young dancers. They rose slowly as the words were sung, to stand erect, clenched fists upraised as the song ended. The theatre was over, but my curiosity remained. Next day I went to interview Miss Wei Gongzhi, director of the People's Anti-Japanese Dramatic Society. Miss Wei was born in Henan in 1907 and had been a red for ten years. She originally joined a propaganda corps at the political training school, where Deng Xiaoping was director, of the Guomindun, Christian general Feng Yuxiang's army. But when Feng reconciled himself to the Nanjing coup d'etat in 1927, she deserted, along with many young students, and became a communist in Hankou. In 1929, she was sent to Europe by the Communist Party and studied for a while in France, then in Moscow. A year later, she returned to China, successfully ran the Guomindang blockade around Red China, and began work in Jiujiang. She told me something of the history of the Red Theatre. Dramatic groups were first organised in Jiangxi in 1931, there at the famous Gorky School under the technical direction of Ye Jianying in Jiujiang, with over a thousand students recruited from the Soviet districts, the Reds trained about 60 theatrical troops, according to Miss Wei. They travelled through the villages and at the front. Every troop had long waiting lists of requests from village Soviets. The peasants, always grateful for any diversion in their culture-starved lives, voluntarily arranged all transport, food and housing for these visits. In the south, Miss Wei had been an assistant director, but in the northwest she had charge of the whole organisation of dramatics. She made the long march from Jiangxi, one of the very few Soviet women who lived through it. Theatrical troops were created in Soviet Xianxi before the Southern Army reached the Northwest, but with the arrival of new talent from Jiangxi, the dramatic art apparently acquired new life. There were about 30 such travelling theatrical troops there now, Miss Wei told me, and others in Gansu. I was to meet many later on in my travels. Every army has its own dramatic group, Miss Wei continued, as well as nearly every district. The actors are nearly all locally recruited. Most of our experienced players from the South have now become instructors. I met several young vanguards, veterans of the Long March, still in their early teens, who had charge of organising and training children's dramatic societies in various villages. Peasants come from long districts to our red dramatics, Miss Wei proudly informed me. Sometimes, when we are near the white borders, Guomindang soldiers secretly send messages to ask our players to come to some market town in the border districts. When we do this, both red soldiers and white leave their arms behind and go to this marketplace to watch our performance. But the higher officers of the Guomindang never permit this, if they know about it. Because once they have seen our players, many of the Guomindang soldiers will no longer fight our Red Army. What surprised me about these dramatic clubs was that, equipped with so little, they were able to meet a genuine social need. They had the scantest properties and costumes, yet with these primitive materials they managed to produce the authentic illusion of drama. The players received only their food and clothing and small living allowances, but they studied every day, like all communists and they believed themselves to be working for China and the Chinese people. They slept anywhere, cheerfully ate what was provided for them, walked long distances from village to village. From the standpoint of material comforts, they were unquestionably the most miserably rewarded thespians on earth, 
yet I hadn't seen any who looked happier. The Reds wrote nearly all their own plays and songs, some were contributed by versatile officials, but most of them were prepared by story writers and artists in the propaganda department. Several Red dramatic skits were written by Zhang Fang Wu, a well-known Hunanese author whose adherence to Soviet Jiangxi in 1933 had excited Shanghai. More recently, Ding Ling, China's foremost woman author, had added her talent to the Red Theatre. There was no more powerful weapon of propaganda in the communist movement than the Red's dramatic troops, and none more subtly manipulated. By constant shifts of programme, by almost daily changes of the living newspaper scenes, new military, political, economic and social problems became the material of drama, and doubts and questionings were answered in a humorous, understandable way for the sceptical peasantry. When the Reds occupied new areas, it was the Red theatre troupe that calmed the fears of the people, gave them rudimentary ideas of the Red programme, and dispensed great quantities of revolutionary thoughts to win the people's confidence. During the Reds' 1935 Shanxi expedition, for example, hundreds of peasants heard about the Red players with the army and flocked to see them. The whole thing was propaganda in art carried to the ultimate degree, and plenty of people would say, why drag art into it? Yet, in its broadest meaning, it was art, for it conveyed for its spectators the illusions of life, and if it was a naive art, it was because the living material with which it was made, and the living men to whom it appealed, were in their approach to life's problems also naive. For the masses of China, there was no fine partition between art and propaganda. There was only a distinction between what was understandable in human experience and what was not. One could think of the whole history of the communist movement in China as a grand propaganda tour, and the defence, not so much of the absolute tightness of certain ideas, perhaps, as of their right to exist. I was not sure that they might not prove to be the most permanent service of the Reds, even if they were in the end defeated and broken. For millions of young peasants who had heard the Marxist gospel preached by those beardless youths, thousands of whom were now dead, the old exorcisms of Chinese culture would never again be quite as effective. Wherever in their incredible migrations destiny had moved these reds, they had vigorously demanded deep social changes, for which the peasants could have learned to hope in no other way, and they had brought new faith and action to the poor and the oppressed. However badly they had erred at times, however tragic had been their excesses, However exaggerated had been the emphasis here or the stress there, it had been their sincere and sharply felt propagandistic aim to shake, to arouse the millions of rural Chinese to their responsibilities in society, to awaken them to a belief in human rights, to combat the timidity, passiveness and static faiths of Taoism and Confucianism, to educate, to persuade, and no doubt at times beleaguer and coerce them to fight for the reign of the people, a new vision in rural China, to fight for the life of justice, equality, freedom and human dignity, as the communists saw it, far more than all the pious but meaningless resolutions passed at Nanjing, this growing pressure from a peasantry gradually standing erect in the state of consciousness after two millenniums of sleep could force the realisation of a vast mutation over the land. What this communism amounted to in a way was that, for the first time in history, Thousands of educated youths stirred to great dreams themselves by a universe of scientific knowledge to which they were suddenly given access, returned to the people, went to the deep soil base of their country to reveal some of their new won learning to the intellectually sterile countryside, the dark living peasantry, and sought to enlist its alliance in building a more abundant life. Fired by the belief that a better world could be made, and that only they could make it, they carried their formula, the ideal of the commune back to the people for sanction and support. And to a startling degree, they seemed to be winning it. They had brought to millions by propaganda and action a new conception of the state, society, and the individual. I often had a queer feeling among the Reds that I was in the midst of a host of schoolboys, engaged in a life of violence because some strange design of history had made this seem infinitely more important to them than football games, textbooks, love, or the main concerns of youth in any other countries. At times I could scarcely believe that it had only been this determined aggregation of youth, equipped with an idea that had directed a mass struggle for ten years against all the armies of Nanjing. How had this incredible brotherhood arisen, banded together, held together, and whence came its strength? And why had it perhaps, after all, failed to mature? Why did it still seem fundamentally like a mighty demonstration, like a crusade of youth? How could one ever make it plausible to those who had seen nothing of it? Then Mao Zedong began to tell me something about his personal history, and as I wrote it down, night after night, I realised that this was not only his story, but an explanation of how communism grew, 
a variety of it real and indigenous to China, and why it had won the adherence and support of thousands of young men and women. It was a story that I was to hear later on with rich variations in the life stories of many other Red Leaders. It was a story that people would want to read, I thought, 